Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's great to see you today. If you will notice, there is someone suspiciously not here today. Uh, our worship pastor, Josh uh, Foster, who is the only person who has been here every single day uh, for setup uh, and tear down since we've gone portable. Uh, he's on vacation today. Isn't that great? And everything didn't fall apart without him. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're excited that he is he's able to take a break um, and... Um, and excited to get away. Uh, him and Amy are, are spending some time up in South Dakota and are going to look at wildlife and bears and Mount Rushmore and, and fun things like that. Uh, so this morning, though, uh, we are not there. And so we are here. So for a few minutes, we're going to buckle down. We're going to open our Bibles. We're going to flip around a whole lot. Uh, look at a lot of scripture today because there is something that we want to talk about. If you've been with us in this series, we've been, we've been in the series we've been calling Sanctuary, uh, where we've been looking about this idea of finding home in faith. And there's a passage at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5 where the Apostle Paul is writing to a young church and he gives them 17 instructions, 17 specific things to do to live out faith to find that home in faith. This is the list of 17. We've gone through all of these except for number 14 and 15. And so today we are going to jump in and, and, and round out our series by talking about the idea of prophecy. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 says this, do not despise prophecy. Last week, if you weren't with us, we talked about this idea of not quenching the Holy Spirit and what it means to live with the Holy Spirit in us and, and the Holy Spirit speaking to us, how Jesus sent the Holy Spirit as a helper. We talked about the ideas of ruach and pneuma, which means wind or spirit or breath, depending if you're speaking Hebrew or Greek. And we talked about that we have the life in us, the very life in us is through the Spirit of God in the new life that we have in Jesus is through the Holy Spirit as well, and that he is not just a spirit that is, that is still, but he is active, he's moving. We have this relationship with God. He nudges us, we listen to his voice. He speaks to us through scripture, through other believers, through our own hearts. And we practiced listening to the Holy Spirit. One of the things that we talked about when we talked about the Holy Spirit is this idea that a lot of us are uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit because it it's kind of the weird part of God, if I'm real frank. Like, it's kind of, I mean, sometimes they call him the Holy Ghost. And like, I understand that it's like Halloween season, but like ghosts? Like, that's weird. And so we wrapped our head around this idea last week. And similar to that, we have a verse that says, do not despise prophecies. And how I think that some of us have been uncomfortable growing up with the Holy Spirit, and what, what the gifts of the Spirit look like, I think some of us are uncomfortable with the idea of prophecy. The first time I experienced prophecy was actually before I was born. Someone prophesied over my life that I would be doing this, that I would speak the word of God to people, that I would proclaim truth, that I would preach, that I would teach the gospel. And maybe you could go, well, your dad did that. So they were just kind of saying, you're probably going to do the same thing as your father. Okay. Uh, and, and, and if you want to think that, that that's, that's okay. The problem is if we go down that route, we have to ignore some parts of scripture. Like this one right here that says, the apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Paul is telling us that we should desire the gifts and we should desire the spiritual gift of prophecy. And I think that part of the problem is that many people misinterpret what prophecy actually is. This week I was spending time with some of my office and we were kind of walking through the sermon and I asked, hey, what do you think prophecy is? Like if I said, hey, what is prophecy? What, what would you say? And they said, it's predicting the future. And I think that many of us view prophecy like that. Like it's, it's that Miss Cleo version. Like we're just the mystical future. We're trying to, to figure out the solution. Y'all remember Miss Cleo, right? She was the Jamaican fortune teller lady that you could call and pay money and she would tell you your fortune, except turns out she wasn't from Jamaica at all. I think she was like from Connecticut or something like that. 
For those of you like teenagers in the audience who are like, I have no idea who Miss Cleo is, <sighs> that's going to be a roller coaster over Google search for you. But I think that many of us view it like that. Many people, your, your introduction to prophecy was, wasn't through scripture even, it was through media, through books, through literature, through stories, through movies. Maybe your introduction to prophecy was through Harry Potter or Star Wars. The prophecies of, of the one, which by the way, both of those take aspects of scripture and apply it to the secular context. There is only one. I think others of us who recognize prophecy is true need to be weary of some things as well. Because I think that if we're, we're not careful, then we put all uh, uh, prophecy, all the chips in one prophecy basket and we kind of ignore the larger truth of scripture. Here's what I mean by that. If you ever follow someone or hear someone or someone teaches and they fixate on just one very specific area of prophecy, then be very wary, be very careful. Let me give you an example of this. There are some people who you will hear again and again and again and again and again. All they do is talk about the prophecies of the end times. And they talk a lot about the Middle East. They talk about a lot about Israel. They'll talk a lot about America and they talk a lot about culture. Now hear me, I'm not saying that there's not prophecies that point to things. I'm saying that when all that you think of prophecy as is the end of the world, you're missing a New Testament understanding of the prophetic. And I'm not saying that some of those things aren't true, but be weary of someone who only ever focuses on the end of the world because that's not living for the kingdom today. Also, I think we need to be weary of groups or associations of prophecy with pastors or ministries where the people seem suspicious or questionable or fly in private jets. <laughs> A few years ago, I think it was Jake, showed me this video of this guy who <laughs> was being investigated for fraud and he's on the witness stand and they're asking him all these questions about these ministry expenses. And one of them was like, he spent like $10,000 on clothes. And he's, and he's like sitting in the witness stand defending it. Like, yeah, I like get the stuff I wear to preach in. Yeah, like I need those. I need that, that Gucci belt. <laughs> I wear a Target belt. <laughs> I need those $700 of shoes. $13 clearance. I know, right? I, amen, right? <laughs> And I remember seeing this guy standing up there trying to defend while he, why he needed, I think it was a Porsche as a ministry expense. Be weary of people who are prophetic and their prophecies always lead to you giving them something. So then if we're cautious about this, Okay, Joel, you've talked a lot about what prophecy isn't. Then are you going to tell us what prophecy is? Short answer is yes, right? The gift of prophecy is the declaration of the mind of God in the power of the Spirit. The declaration of the mind of God in the power of the Spirit. That's speaking the thoughts of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Many of us struggle with or find a difficult thinking like how can someone else speak for God? But if we look at scripture, it is all through scripture again and again and again and again. That God uses people to, to declare his word. In fact, the Bibles, the, maybe the very Bibles that you're holding, we believe in the inerrant word of God. We believe that God wrote the Bible through man. Even the Bibles themselves are, are a prophetic book. Look at this in First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter one, verse 20. It says, "Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So true prophecy doesn't come from people. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men speak from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
Here's what this means. Is that if, if a prophecy is really a prophecy, it's spoken from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. That if it's just a person talking, if it's just me saying, hey, here's a prophecy, like that's not a prophecy, that's a false prophecy. There are two types of prophecies that I want to kind of walk through today. I told these to Josh this week, we're, we're walking through my sermon, and he was like, did you learn that in Larry McGraw's New Testament class? And I was like, you bet, yeah, I did. So some of my seminary education for you. The first one is this, it's called foretelling. This is what most of us think of when we think of prophecy. It's using wisdom from God to speak about something in the future, right? This is the generally accepted idea of, of most people's standard idea of prophecy. It's the prophetic, it's predicting the future. Except it's really not predicting it when it's God, it's knowing the future. We see examples of this in the Bible, right? Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Who's this about? Jesus, except it was written way before Jesus was born. It's a prophecy. It's a foretelling prophecy through the prophet Isaiah written to the people of Israel. It's foretelling. Here's another one. This is in the New Testament. Acts chapter 11, it says, now these days, now in these days, a prophet came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So there's a church in Jerusalem, there's a church in Antioch. There's the New Testament, they're all proclaiming Jesus. And one of them was named Agabus. And he stood up and foretold, there's the word even, foretold by the Spirit. There's our check, it's, it's from the Holy Spirit. That there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So we already know, Scripture tells us that he gave this prophecy and it came true. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to brothers living in Judea. This is important. They did something with the prophecy they received. They made a difference in the body of believers. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So again, we see this idea of foretelling in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Maybe someone has given you a word that said, hey, I feel like God's telling me in the future you're going to experience this. And you experienced that, right? That would be foretelling. It's the most commonly understood type of prophecy. But it's not the, the, the most common occurring type of prophecy. Most of us think about that as prophecy. But, but the most common type of prophecy is not foretelling, it's something called forthtelling. It's utilizing wisdom from God to speak truth to a current situation. It's not about what's going to happen, it's about interpreting what's happening now through God's eyes. And as much as we see foretelling in scripture, we see this a lot more. Almost every one of the prophets came to give interpretation to the current situation that Israel was living in. Every single time. And they give them a warning, hey, if you don't do this, this bad thing will happen. So there's elements of foretelling in there. But almost always, let me give you an example. Right? Jonah, the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. This is a word of prophecy. But it's not about what's going to happen in the future. It's about what's happening right then. He didn't say, Go to Nineveh, because in the future they're going to sin. No, their sin is right now. If you don't know the rest of the story, it gets really suspicious and fishy. <laughs> I'm going to think about that later and laugh again. <laughs> this is forthtelling. It's really looking at a current situation. It's using wisdom from God by the power of the Holy Spirit to give insight to a current situation. We see this in the New Testament. Paul, who preached just about everywhere he went, went to a place called the Areopagus. Some people refer to it as Mars Hill. And he preached this sermon to all of these Greek men. And this is what he says. He says, now, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. His perception is of the current situation. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And then he goes on to tell them that the unknown God they're worshiping is Jesus. It's the one true God. Paul is speaking to a current situation. I perceive that you're religious men. Now let me, and I perceive that you are worshiping something that you don't know about. Let me illuminate, bring light, bring understanding to truth. Let me uh, interpret truth of the situation for you. Prophecy speaks to the truth of a situation as seen through God's perspective. And he uses men and women to do this. In the Old Testament, we, we, it's easy to, to spot the the prophets, because we call them prophets, right? We have books that we refer to as the prophets. You have major prophets and minor prophets, and it's not a level of importance. It's just how long-winded they were when they were writing their books. In the New Testament, we have prophets, but it, it looks different. We don't have books categorized by major New Testament prophets and minor New Testament prophets. But I'll remind you that Paul says that we all should desire this gift of prophecy. We should all desire the ability to speak prophetically, to speak truth. And how we see that shows up in different ways. Last week, we talked about this idea of the nudging of the Holy Spirit, of trying to listen to God speak to us. Sometimes God speaks to us. My number one spiritual gift is the gift of prophecy. By the way, if you don't know your spiritual gift and you want to find out today at 1145 after the service, we're doing a class, we call it Engage. It's learning out how you can get connected. And one of the things that we do in that class is a spiritual gifts assessment. I would love for you to join us for that. Because when I take that, my number one spiritual gift is the gift of prophecy. It's speaking prophetically. We do this sometimes on Sunday mornings where you hear us at the end of service and we say, hey, we feel like God is saying that so-and-so needs to come up and receive prayer. We get prophetic words that we feel like God is telling us to proclaim. Sometimes we get words of encouragement for one another, right? We call it a word of knowledge, a word of truth. But that's not the only way prophecy works. We also see prophecy as applying scripture to current situations. It's bringing illumination some of the most prophetic moments of my entire life is someone shares a scripture with me that I see in a completely different and new light and it speaks to exactly where I am. You ever been sitting in a sermon? Probably not one of mine, maybe one of mine. Maybe somebody else's where you went, man, I feel like they were talking just to me today. That is exercising the gift of the prophetic. It's proclaiming the knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit to someone. It doesn't have to be mystical. We do worship a supernatural God, and I'm not going to pretend like we don't. We do see prophecy about the future. We see it in Scripture. We see prophecies that's yet to be fulfilled. But we also see prophecy that, that, that feels easier, more tangible to grasp. Because it's when we apply truth of who God is to a current situation, and when someone speaks that into us, that is prophetic. Some of you have been speaking prophetically, and you don't even know it but you're doing it. So the question becomes, how should we as believers use prophecy? How do we, how do we apply it? In Ephesians chapter, chapter four, verse 11, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. He gave them, right? He, God gave these individuals to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And our interpretation of that, we do this through the church, through the body of believers. And we have, we, we equip, we, we work to do these things for the building up of the body of Christ. To see that the, that the body is, is strengthened, but also to see that the body of Christ grows. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we all attain in unity under the banner of the knowledge of the Son of God, knowledge of who Jesus is. To mature manhood or womanhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, 
so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, so that we're not theological children, so that we don't just listen to the latest theological women go, oh, that sounds interesting, or oh, that sounds interesting, so that we can know truth in maturity as mature believers. So we're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. This is what this tells us. There will be people who use false words of God to try to deceive you into something that is not true. There are false prophets. People who speak words, again, that do not lead to Jesus, that are not through the Holy Spirit, that is not to the truth of who God is. Then look, here we go. Rather, speaking the truth in love, that's the prophetic speaking the truth in love. We use, this, we use this verse, speaking the truth in love, often when we're like well, telling someone bad news or telling them what they're doing is bad. Hey, I'm just trying to speak the truth in love. I think we sometimes misapply and weaponize this passage. And I'm not saying there's not certain situations where we speak the truth in love and call out sin. Again, we equip the saints for ministry and sometimes equipping is, is, is calling people to repentance. But this idea is the same concept in scripture that we see for, pro, for prophecy, for speaking the prophetic. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it is, so that it builds itself up in love. In this passage where it's talking about speaking the truth, where it's talking about, about those who have the spiritual gift of prophecy, we see some things and we see how we as believers should apply the prophetic in our everyday lives. And the first one is this, as so we encourage other believers. Throughout the New Testament, the way prophecy is used the absolute most is to encourage other believers. Again and again and again, we see throughout the letters of Paul and the writings of Paul, and we see it in Acts, we see it in the Gospels, that the prophetic is to encourage. It's speaking truth to encourage and build up other believers. Just like this passage says, right? for building up the body of Christ. That's building up in heart and in knowledge. We want to speak truth. We want to convey the truth of who God is and what his word says to build others up. You ever experienced a moment where you were just so discouraged Maybe life wasn't going the way you wanted it to. Maybe you were overwhelmed by your situations. And you had just that one person that encouraged you, that showed you love. Almost every Sunday morning on the way to church, I get a text from someone. It could come from a few different people. But almost always I get a text from one of my closest friends saying, hey, I'm praying for you this morning. I'm praying for Lighthouse and I'm praying that God uses you to speak truth. Or I'm praying for Lighthouse. I feel like God is telling me something impactful is going to happen in someone's life today. Those bits of encouragement that I receive every single week this morning, right? My mentor and, and, and who I consider my pastor Pastor David, I'm driving the truck, driving the trailer, and I get a message from him just saying he's praying for us. In that moment, I had someone who I know and trust, and I'm dealing with some stuff today, that he speaks truth into my life about the goodness of God. That's a moment of the prophetic. And he used it to encourage me as a fellow believer. 
The other thing that we see in this passage, though, is this idea of that there is unity in the body of Christ. We equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Again, in verse 15, it talks about rather speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from, who, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Jesus unifies us. We are unified in, in Christ. Yet we, since, since the beginning of the church, we've been looking for ways to divide. But the prophetic speaks words of unity to the body. And the third way that I think we should use the prophetic is to convey the truth of scripture to individual situations. Guys, this is as simple as reading a verse and going, hey man, I think this would be really impactful for somebody else. I've known people who when they do their Bible studies, if they read a verse that stands out to them and God highlights it, they ask God, hey, is there someone specific this is, I should share this verse with? And they just write the name in the margin. And then they call that person and just, or text them and just share the verse. Hey, I wanted to encourage you, was reading this, thought this verse was for you today. It can be as simple as that. Man, I'll tell you, if anyone's ever sent me a verse and said, hey, I was reading this verse, thought of you today. Like, I'm, I'm never discouraged by that. I take that back. There's a verse in 2 Kings where, the, where a bunch of youth are making fun of a bald guy. <laughs> but then the, the rest of that verse is he calls down a curse and she bears come out of the woods. It's a funny verse. But like, if you send me that, like, I guess that would not be encouraging or prophetic. <laughs> at least I guess we would hope it wouldn't be prophetic. The she bear showing up at your house. There are ways that we can step into this. Maybe you're going, I'm not sure if I've got the gift of prophecy. That's okay. Not everyone has the gift of prophecy. Paul says that we all should, should strive for it. But we can share encouragement in the truth of who God is. I'm not saying that everything has to be a specific word of knowledge. Sometimes it's just conveying the, what scripture says to somebody else. It's just saying the words of God that we already have to the people of God who need to hear it. Our passage says that we should not despise prophecy. Are you despising prophecy? Do you, do you want nothing to do with it? Are you learning and willing to open your heart to how God can use you to speak prophetically into someone else's life. I think despising is more of a comfort zone. It's going, hey, like, that's weird. I don't want to touch that. I don't want to deal with that. Make no mistake that we don't worship. We don't worship a God who is bound by our rules. We worship a supernatural God who works in supernatural ways every single day, who wants to impact your life, who wants to work in your life. We don't worship a dead God. Our God is alive. He still moves. He still speaks to us. We have a relationship with him. We grow with him. And the supernatural may be difficult for us to, to deal with in terms of, of how God uses us for his purpose, but it doesn't mean he doesn't use us for his purpose. Because the last time I checked, God did not care about your comfort zone. If anything, when I read the Bible, I see again and again and again where he kind of laughs at people's comfort zones and, and asks them to step out of it. And maybe this idea is outside of your comfort zone. And that's okay. But in conveying the truth of scripture, we see men and women using the prophetic to make a difference. The biggest problem I think that we have with prophecy is this question right here. How do I know if a prophecy is true? 
If we believe scripture, we know that when we, we read scripture, it is our source of truth. How can I trust that if someone is speaking it instead of me reading it in, in the Bible? How, how can I know that prophecy is true? You know why I think that we ask this? is because almost all of us have seen examples of prophecy that is not true. You know how many times the world is supposed to have ended in my lifetime? So many. They keep making movies about them too. And songs. Jesus was supposed to return so many different times, I think that I've lost count. Hey, you want to know the truth? Do I believe in the second coming? Sure. But I also believe that Jesus said, I am with you always. So if you're sitting there waiting for Jesus to come back, don't miss the Jesus that you have right now. So how do we know if a prophecy is true? There are people who, not this presidential election, let me be very clear, but the last presidential election made some pretty bold prophetic statements and they were very wrong. How do we deal with people who publicly and boldly make prophetic statements and then they're wrong? Probably the best way that I've seen is that someone actually said, hey, I, I need to confess my own sin that I wasn't speaking out of the prophetic, I was speaking out of my own desires. So how do we know if prophecy is true? How do we know that the people aren't just trying to pull one over on us? How do we know that someone is actually conveying the mind of God through the power of the Holy Spirit? The very next verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, right? And it kind of goes in this chain, right? We don't quench the Holy Spirit, don't despise prophecy, but test everything. And hold fast to what is good. Test everything. Say everything. What do you think that means? There we go. Everything. Test everything. How do we test everything? I want to give you four steps that you can use to test everything. Especially when we're talking about things of the spirit or things of the prophetic. But here's the thing, this is, this is the difficult part. It actually requires you to do something. Like to test it, you, you can't just ignore it, right? We don't despise prophecy, but we test everything. So there's some legwork involved for us. The first thing I would tell you is that we need to be weary of people who proclaim to be prophetic, but lack accountability. A lot of those are the same people who have the private jets, by the way. Be weary, though, of people who proclaim to be prophetic but lacked accountability. Here's, here's the, the first one. I want you to write down or you can take a picture of this, right? Number one, do you trust the source of the prophetic word? Ask yourself this question. In testing everything, do I trust where this is coming from? I was doing ministry in downtown New Orleans with a group of students one day and we were dealing with some really heavy stuff and we were praying for people and, and seeing some, some dark, dark things. And this person walks up to me whom I did not know. He saw that we were praying for people and he told me that he had a, a prophetic word for me. He actually said, hey man, I got a prophecy for you. And I said, oh, okay. And he be, I cannot, I don't even know how to repeat what he said to me. It was a bunch of weird words jumbled together. Here's the thing. I knew that that was not a prophetic word for my life. You know why? One, I could smell the alcohol on the guy. And I did not trust the source of the prophetic word. He had no credibility or accountability. I tried to talk to him for a little bit. It went downhill quickly. Do you trust the source of the prophetic word? In Acts chapter 19, there's a situation where uh, the apostle Paul has been healing and casting out demons. In verse 13, you, you see that there's these two itinerant Jewish exorcists, which apparently is an itinerant job in ancient Israel. There was the itinerant Jewish exorcist and they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had the evil spirit, right? 
Keep in mind, they are not actually believers and followers of Jesus. They just see that Paul had been using the name of Jesus to get demons to go away. So they're like, we're going to try that. So this is what they said. They look at a person who's possessed by a demon and said, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. And it says seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. So there are seven people who are trying to cast out demons by the name of Jesus that Paul talks about. But this, the evil spirit answers back to them and said to them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? It's one of my favorite <laughs> scriptures in the whole Bible. It's so funny. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Insult and injury. It's kind of funny. Jesus I've heard, or Jesus I know, Paul I've heard of, but who are you? But there's the truth in this that I don't want you to miss. The reason the demons didn't flee is because the source wasn't trusted. To be able to speak the prophetic, 1 John talks about how we have to profess Jesus. You can't speak the word of the truth of God if you don't know God. The second thing that I want to give you to test this is this question. Does a prophetic word agree with the truth of Scripture? Hear me. I am, let me be as clear as I can be on this. A prophetic word will never, ever contradict the word of God. Ever. It just won't happen. If someone tells you something that is contradictory to scripture, if someone tells you something and you believe it, then you read scripture and see different truth. It doesn't mean there's special exceptions. There's something that, that sometimes people use that we call a secret word of knowledge. And secret words of knowledge is, hey, God told me this, but like it's not in the Bible and he just told me. We wouldn't be told to test everything if secret words of knowledge were true. Does a prophetic word agree with the truth of Scripture? And if it does and if it applies to your situation, then maybe just maybe someone has spoken into your life prophetically. And then I want to leave you with these two. The first one is this. If someone gives you a prophetic word, seek confirmation from another tr trusted Christian. It's okay to ask someone, hey, will you listen to this? Someone told me this. If someone gives you a prophetic word, it's okay to write it down. In fact, I would encourage you to write it down. And it's okay to speak to another believer, maybe a, a small group leader, maybe one of your pastors or friends who you trust. One of our elders of our church. Hey, someone spoke this to me. Will you pray with me? Do you see this contradicted anywhere in scripture? Will you pray for confirmation for this? And then lastly, ask God for confirmation. We don't worship a God, again, that doesn't move, that doesn't speak to us. Ask him to speak to us. Sometimes we will speak prophetically by opening the word and proclaiming the word. Sometimes we will speak prophetically when God puts a word on our heart for someone. We've got to be willing to step into it, even if we're uncomfortable. We don't have the truth of who God is for us to just hoard it and, and, and to hold it just for ourselves. It's for the unity of the body. It's to encourage the body. It's to speak the truth of scripture to individual situations. And I know it may not be the most comfortable place for you. And that's okay. There's a lot of people who are uncomfortable in the Bible and God still used them. So here is my request of you this morning. That you would open your heart to receive truth. And that you would open your heart to speak truth specifically to those that you're close to. I'm not saying you got to come up here next Sunday and proclaim your prophetic word. 
But I am asking that you begin where we just ended and you seek God and ask him what word that you should receive and what word he has for you to offer. As you read scripture, consider if the words that you're reading in the Bible could bless someone else, could speak to someone else's situation. And if they can, don't just hold that and hide it, but share it, offer it, text it, call, speak it. Because if we can encourage one another, if we can build up the body, if we can speak the truth of scripture in individual circumstances, we will be stronger believers, we will be a stronger church, and we will be a stronger force for Jesus in the world. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. And we love you. We ask this morning, Lord, that we don't have a heart that despises prophecy, but that we desire this gift to speak truth from your mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen.